So today's topic is going to be radiometric dating. So let's go ahead and get started. So when we look at the layers of rock beneath the surface, we see that you know any fossil in this layer of rock is going to are going to be the youngest. And then any fossils in the next layer are going to be a little older. Any fossils in the next layer down are going to be a little older. And any fossils in the next layer down are going to be the oldest. Well, this is what's called relative dating. Relative to one another, we can figure out which of these samples is the oldest and the youngest. But radiometric dating is a lot more precise. It can obtain the absolute age of a fossil, how many thousands or millions of years old a sample might be. So to understand radiometric dating, we have to understand what isotopes are. You know, carbon-12 and carbon-14 are two very common examples of isotopes. Atoms of the same element, they're both carbon, but they contain a different number of neutrons. So when I look at the carbon on uh, the square on the top, I see it has the atomic number of six. Well, that means six protons. Anything with six protons is going to be carbon. But the 12 is the mass, and the mass is when you add up the protons and neutrons. So 6 protons plus what mystery number adds up to 12? Well, that's just 6. But look at the square beneath it. Well, it has the atomic number of 6. Again, that means 6 protons. After all, this is still carbon. And then the 14 means protons and neutrons add up to 14. So 6 plus what mystery number is 14? Well, that's the number 8. And so you see the definition of isotopes. They're both the same element. These are both carbon, but they have a different number of neutrons. Now, the reason this is important is because carbon-14 is radioactive, and it will decay over a period of time. And we can measure the decay to figure out how old a sample might be. So let's focus on carbon-12 and carbon-14. They're isotopes of carbon, and they're in the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. So when plants take in and other autotrophs, when plants and autotrophs take in the carbon to do photosynthesis, uh, they use the carbon and, and they make glucose. So when they take in the carbon from the atmosphere, they're taking in not just carbon-12, but also carbon-14. And that carbon, whether it's carbon-12 or carbon-14, is transferred up the food chain when one organism eats another and eats another and eats another. So when an organism is alive, you would expect the ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-14 to be very similar to that of the atmosphere. After all, this carbon came from the atmosphere. But when an organism dies, start the clock, the decay of carbon-14 begins. And over time, carbon-14 will decay and change and break down into nitrogen. So if something is recently dead, the remains will still possess a whole lot of carbon-14 because not much time has passed for it to decay. But if a sample is long dead, then its remains will possess much less carbon-14 because more time has passed for it to decay. Well, let's talk about this decay. Well, let's talk about the time it takes for an isotope to decay, what's known as its half-life. And the half-life is the time it takes for half, or 50%, of the amount of isotope to decay. And in the example of carbon-14, it's been measured to take about 5,730 years for half of the amount of carbon-14 in a sample to decay. Well, right now, our cow is a living organism, and so it's going to have 100% of the carbon-14 that it will ever have as it takes in uh, carbon from you know, eating plants, as we just mentioned on the previous slide. But look at the uh, first layer buried underneath the ground. And this is a fossil of a horse. Let's pretend that this fossil was discovered and, and it has 50% of the carbon-14 as those living today. Well, we would say that one half-life has passed, which we know is 5,730 years. And so we would say that this horse, or this fossil of the horse, is 5,730 years old. But look at the next fossil beneath it. Let's pretend this fossil is found and is discovered to have 25% of the carbon-14 remaining. Well, 25 is half of 50, 
and 50 is half of 100. So two half lives have passed since this organism was alive. So two times the half life of 5,730, this fossil would estimate to be about 11,460 years old. We'll look at the next fossil beneath it. Let's pretend this third fossil is found and discovered and, and is analyzed and it has 12.5% of the carbon-14 as those alive today. Well, 12.5% is half of 25, 25% is half of 50, and 50% is a half of 100. So in other words, three half-lives have passed since this thing was alive. And so we would estimate this to be 17,190 years old. The fourth fossil, let's just repeat the pattern. Let's pretend it has 6.25% of the carbon-14 as those alive today. Well, that's half of 12.5%. 12.5 is half of 25%. 25% is half of 50%. 50% is half of 100%. In other words, four half-lives have passed since this organism was living, and so we would say it's about 22,920 years old. And finally, at the bottom, let's pretend this fish fossil is analyzed and it has 3.125% of the carbon-14. Well, we're now up to five half-lives of time have passed since this was alive. And so five times 5,730, we would estimate to be about 28,650 years old. Well, let's go ahead and plot this information in a graph. And what you see in the graph is exactly what we just talked about. You can see at 50%, if a sample has 50% of the carbon-14 remaining, it would estimate to be about 5,730 years old. If a sample has 25% of its carbon-14 remaining, it would estimate to be 11,460 years old. If a sample has 12.5% of its carbon-14, it would estimate to be 17,190 years old. Well, now this is great for, you know, the, uh, the, the data that we just talked about, but what if there's something that is discovered that is in between? Well, let's look at that. What if a fossil is found to have 70% of its carbon-14 remaining? Well, this is where you can see the, the, the beauty of a line graph. We can just kind of estimate by drawing an imaginary line down and we would say, oh, if it has 70% of its carbon-14 remaining, it would be roughly around 3,000 years old, you know, give or take a few years, of course. What if a sample, what if a fossil is found to have 20% of its carbon-14 remaining? Well, then if we draw an imaginary line down, we would say, oh, that's about 14,000 years old. So you can see with the decay rate of carbon-14, we can roughly estimate with pretty good accuracy the ages of, of fossils. You know, as useful as carbon dating might be, you, you can see that this graph does present a problem. Eventually, the amount of carbon-14 becomes so small that it, it's uh, really uh, difficult to measure. And so carbon dating is only accurate to maybe about 50, 60,000 years. If something is older than that, then uh, other isotopes have to be examined. And one of those other isotopes is potassium-40. It has a much longer half-life. Its half-life is 1.25 billion years. When you look at the graph, the graph, the line looks similar as the carbon graph, but look at the timeline on the bottom. We're in billions of years. So if a sample is discovered to have 50% of its potassium-40 remaining, then we would have say, said that one half-life would have passed, and the sample would be estimated to be about 1.25 billion years old. If a sample is found to have 25% of its potassium-40 remaining, then two half-lives will have passed, and the sample will be, will be uh, estimated at 2.5 billion years old. If a sample has 12.5% of its potassium-40 remaining. Then three half-lives will have passed and the sample will have will be estimated to be 3.75 billion years old. And if a sample has 6.25 percent of its potassium-40 remaining, well then four half-lives will have passed and the sample would estimate to be about 5 billion years old. So as I wrap up this video, it's because of radiometric dating that we can say the Earth is 
four and a half billion years old and that humans have been around for about 200,000 years because by studying the decay of isotopes left behind in fossils and rocks, we can accurately estimate the age of these particular samples. So I hope you found this video helpful and thanks for watching.